Good morning. The Salvation of the Unbeliever. My name is Rob here, and um, I'm going to bring another show here today, so we will get started right away. I have a passage of scripture that I'm going to read, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about it. Now, that's a tough one, the salvation of the unbeliever, because there's so much taught in the churches and mainstream religion today about uh, you have to do something for God, and you have to uh, accept Jesus as your personal Savior, and there's so much that uh, is fed in a bad way to many people who don't want anything to do with God now because of it. So I kind of want to bring this today because people need to know that they will be saved eventually whether they believe in God or not. And uh, I think this is actually for the unbeliever today. Um, there's many who do believe in God, but they don't really actually know him. So this will also help as well. Um, there's a passage of scripture that I'm going to bring here to, and it's 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then I will explain a little bit more about it after I'm done reading. Okay, starting in verse 20, it says, yet now, in Christ, now, yet now Christ has been roused from among the dead, the first fruit of those who are reposing. For since, in fact, through a man came death, through a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be made alive, or vivified. That's the actual proper word for that. Made alive, vivification, is to energize or bring alive. Yet each in his own class, the first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ's in his presence, thereafter the consummation. Whenever, whenever he may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished, death. For he subjects all under his feet. Now whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who, is, who subjects all to him. Now whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him, who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. Now those words might be confusing because it just goes, uh, you don't really know inside the context of who it's speaking about. And this is the reason why I wanted to bring this topic here today, because the salvation of um, the unbeliever is very important in God's process. Very important. Otherwise, he could not become all in all, which is the ending of that passage. Now, uh, of course, right at the start, the first fruit of those who are reposing is Christ. And uh, those who are reposing are these the ones who are asleep. Now, you look at all the graveyards all over the earth. You look at everyone who has ever died on this earth, past and present. Those people are sleeping. There's not one in heaven. There is only one who is in heaven, and that is Christ himself. Right now, I want to just give you an explanation of reposing. That is sleep. And sleep, is, there is no comprehension. In sleep... You don't know the passage of time. Time is irrelevant when it comes to sleeping. It's just like when you go to sleep at night, you hours pass by, you don't realize it, and then you're awake. So it's just that quick. But hours may have passed, but you're in oblivion, basically. So sleep is basically, that's what it is, exactly what it is, oblivion. You know nothing. So all these people who have died... These are sleeping until the resurrection, and God will raise them. For since, in fact, through a man came death. Now, I want to explain a little bit about that. The first man was Adam, of course. He was formed out of the soil of the earth, and through him came death. Now, through a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. That is Christ himself. For even as in Adam, all are dying, the first man, all are dying, Thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, or made alive. The real word there is vivification, because it's, an, it's basically an animation. So it would be bringing to life that which is not alive. 
So vivification is a good word there. It is the proper word in the context. Yet each in his own class. I'll stop right there. God has a process with mankind. Each one has a class and set aside and called and made particularly for that class. Um, the first fruit was Christ. And now thereupon those who are Christ in his presence. That's the next passage there. It would explain that there is a company of believers on the earth who have been chosen before the disruption of the world, before they were ever born. These are the members of the body of Christ. Now they will appear in his presence, meaning they will be snatched away from this earth and meet the Lord in the air, and thus always be with the Lord. And um, so the unbelievers right at that, that point will not be raised. They will be still asleep, but they will be raised afterwards. Okay, so the ending of it all is the consummation. Whenever he may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father. Whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy, of course, is death, and that will be abolished. And once death is abolished, then everybody will be raised, immortal, and be with the Lord forever. I don't like using that word forever, but they will be at the end when death is abolished. And that is when forever is. It's not during the eons or during the ages. It is at the end, at the consummation. Okay, so death is abolished and then all is raised. For he subjects all under his feet. So it's talking about Christ now in the next little bit here. It's talking about Christ himself because he, he subjects the universe back to God. So whenever he should be subjecting all under his feet, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. So it's outside of God who subjects all to him, and that is Christ. Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, the Son himself also shall be, shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him. So basically, in that passage there, it's saying that Christ himself will subject all to God the Father. And God the Father afterwards the Son himself will be subjected to God the Father as well, that he may be all in all. Okay, so, the salvation of the unbeliever, that's a given. He has a process and he will do it. Um, classes of people who are on the earth, who, are, who have been created. He knows the end from the beginning. So, of course, in that process you will see that he will be able to reconcile his whole universe back to himself through Christ. Christ is the one that paid for all sin on that Roman stake. So he's the one that is taking the sin of the world away. Um, death is operating right now. And we all go to sleep eventually in death. Um, some may not, though. You have to understand there are members of the body of Christ who are going to be alive when he snatches them away. <clears throat> Their bodies will be changed. They will no longer be fl in flesh and blood. They will be given a new body and taken to the air to meet the Lord in the air. So I just want to give you this good news that God will save all, including the unbeliever. So know this, no matter what your daily life is, no matter whether you believe God or you don't, you'll eventually be saved, and you will be eventually be reconciled back to God. Um, this is not taught in mainstream. It's taught that there is eternal torment for those who do not believe or do not generate anything out of themselves to accept Christ or accept the truth. So what I am teaching right now today is that God will save all including the unbeliever. You have to understand this because uh, it'll give you peace and joy in knowing that you do not really have to work in the sense of uh, accepting Jesus as your personal Savior, which is God who is going to give you the faith anyway to be accepting Him. 
I am thankful that I'm able to bring another message to you today, and I will say grace and peace, and thank you so much for joining me. Have a great day.